So, hello, my name is Aoki. Uh, I'm going to take you completely out of the mammalian world, out of the vertebrates completely, uh, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about mitochondrial gene evolution in uh, sea urchins. Uh, and I came here from uh, University of Kauai, Manoa, still jet lag. So, sea urchins uh, have been recognized as a pretty fantastic model systems in various different fields of biology, everything from molecular to cell to development uh, and to evolutionary biology has used the sea urchin as a model. Uh, Ernst Mayer recognized the system, and in 1954, he published a uh, seminal paper where he started to look at distributions of various tropical echinoids, the sea urchins, across very broad geographic areas. And he used this as one of the basis for the, uh, his argument that allopatric speciation was the predominant way in which new species arise, both in marine and a terrestrial environment, which is a question I'm hoping to revisit before my dissertations happen. But um, a superfamily which featured prominently in this work, uh, and a family uh, of which I'm going to be looking at, um, it's the Odontophora, which includes the famous Strongylus centrodidae, which includes Strongylus centrodidus preparatus, the first sea urchin to have its full genome sequenced and almost completely annotated at this point. Uh, we also have within there the Echinometridae, another broadly distributed tropical urchin. And then finally, the Toxoneustidae. So this is the family that contains my study organism, uh, Chinesis crotilla. And kind of to make it more charismatic, this family also contains the most venomous sea urchin in the world. Not my urchin, but it's, it's close, so it's still interesting. Uh, Chinesis crotilla is the central to Indian Pacific spanning tropical sea urchin. Uh, Hawaii is kind of smack dab there, underneath there, it is sort of in the point. Right there. That's where Chinese Scrotilla is easily found by me, but it extends throughout the Indo-Pacific as well as one species. We have Trinustus depressus across the coast of the Americas, and then we have Trinustus um, ventricosus in the Atlantic. So despite its very impressive global distribution, we have only three recognized species in this genus. So the relationship within the Odontophora presently is recognized uh, with the uh, Toxinustidae, my family, um, being a sister taxa to the Echinometridae, Strongus, and Trotidae sisters. And uh, this is adapted from the Crow and Smith uh, evolution of uh, recent uh, ethanoids. And uh, one of the things that I've been doing for my dissertation work is to generate some reference transcriptomes for Trinustis. And the great thing about uh, transcriptomes is that you get a veritable cornucopia of mitochondrial sequences, which makes it very easy to assemble uh, and put together the full mitochondrial genome. So taking my mitochondrial sequences out of my reference transcriptome, uh, designed some novel primers to fill in any perceived gaps, and uh, being very excited at having completed this mitochondrial genome, uh, I did what most biologists do when they have new data, and I immediately uh, made a tree. And um, I pulled from NCBI GenBank uh, all currently published and curated mitochondrial genomes that are up there. And uh, I generated a Bayesian tree. Uh, this is via the software Mr. Bayes, um, which I'm sure many of us have used. And interestingly enough, my Trinusis gratilla urchin here showed up as sister immediately to the Strongylus centrodidae, with the Echinometridae representative being a basally branching group to those two, which contradicts the previous species tree, but I should specify that this is purely mitochondrial genes. These are 15 mitochondrial genes, the 13 coding regions, the 12, uh, 12S and 16S ribosomal RNAs. Um, each one of those markers had a nucleotide substitution model uh, chosen through uh, J model test two. But uh, after I sort of got the tree out of the way and I felt better, a little bit more relaxed. I actually started to look more specifically at the physical mitochondrial genomes themselves. I aligned them in the software MOV, which is a great algorithm for aligning whole genomes and could handle mitochondrial genomes quite easily. And what I saw was effectively no major rearrangements in terms of gene order across any of the mitochondrial genomes uh, and across two orders of sea urchins. And if that doesn't strike you as being particularly impressive, um, there are families of gastropods, snails, that have inversions in gene arrangement in the mitochondria uh, and infraorder level within crabs that have mitochondrial gene rearrangements between them. So I was excited to see that they're all actually pretty highly conserved in terms of gene order. 
mean length, interestingly enough, just for some summary, uh, 15,705 base pairs with relatively little standard deviation of only less than 30 base pairs. And breaking that down by the individual genes, here I have the names of the genes on the far left, the average size, and then the relative standard deviation, or also known as the coefficient of variation, which is just a standard deviation corrected for by the mean to adjust for the different gene sizes. And what we see is that, that uh, CO2, CO3, and ND3 within the mitochondrial genome have no differences in gene length across the two orders of sea urchin mitochondria that I looked at. Um, the greatest difference was seen in ND6, but even there, we have a relatively low um, residual um, standard deviation. So I wanted to look even further um, at what the differences that I did see actually meant. So in order to sort of quantify what effect the variance we were seeing in the sea urchin tree of life meant, I was, uh, I generated a non-synonymous synonymous ratio and just so that we're all on the same page, I wanted to go quickly over that we all have codons within the genes, trinucleotide, that encode for an amino acid. For a non-synonymous substitution, if a single nucleotide changes and the amino acid changes, that is a non-synonymous substitution. For a synonymous substitution, if we change a nucleotide and nothing happens, we have a synonymous substitution. And so the ratio of these two um, can give me a sense of what these variations actually mean in terms of what's visible to selection. This ratio is expected to be a very low number, uh, much less than one, um, just because a change in an amino acid is slightly more impactful on the average than a single change in a nucleotide that doesn't actually impact the protein. So this is a very conservative estimate for general selection pressures pushing a protein in a certain direction. So first I looked at maximum pairwise non-synonymous and synonymous substitution ratios. And I'm going to be referring to that ratio as omega for the rest of the talk. So only looking at the maximum pairwise, the greatest pairwise difference was found in the gene ATP8. So this is a structural protein in the ATPA synthase um, part of the mitochondrial genome. And this is a particularly interesting gene. It's the shortest within the mitochondrial genome. And it has some interesting properties across various different taxa. Um, it's been highlighted in mitilus, the uh, muscles in the North Atlantic, as being highly related to sex differentiation. It's been noted in chiropterans, bats, as being related to differences in um, energy generation. So there's something interesting about ATP8. It's a whole other can of worms that I can't get into right now, so I'm actually gonna not talk about that one, the most interesting one and I'm actually gonna focus on the rest of them. So CO1 in this case had the lowest omega value, and the three highest values belong to ND5, ND6, and CO3. <coughs> now, those were just the maximum pairwise differences. What I was also interested in was historical signatures of adaptive evolution. So using the software panel, I attempted to import my newly generated um, mitochondrial tree that I was very excited about and actually try to map historical DNDS ratios or omega ratios onto those branches. So now I'm going to show you another series of trees where the branch lengths actually reflect omega values. So the longer the branch, the greater the omega value, and the shorter the branch, the smaller the omega value. Most of the markers within the mitochondrial genome actually suggested not very much change in DNDS ratios or omega at all. So these uh, six markers here suggest a relatively clock-like clock -like rate um, of non-synonymous and synonymous substitutions. So nothing too interesting about that, uh, but luckily for me, a few of them showed something a little bit different, most striking of which was ND4L. So I put the actual calculated omega value there on that longest branch, and you'll notice that's not a um, that's, not a, yeah, that's not a fraction, that's 1,140, which I know what most of you are thinking, that's clearly an alignment error, but I assure you it was aligned via amino acids, uh, so that it was a nucleotide data set that was aligned via the transcribed, translated amino acids, uh, done using the, the echinoderm mitochondrial codon table. Visually check it many times, it does not seem to be an alignment error. And interestingly, it only 
occurred for the family Strongyls introdidae. ND4L is the shortest gene for complex one, so all of the ND genes contribute to the complex one uh, in the mitochondria, and it is the shortest by far. And one thing that's especially concerning about this pattern is that no other individual marker suggested a similar pattern. So there are many things that can explain random evolution or rapid evolution uh, in a mitochondrial gene, cytonuclear incompatibility. There's been suggestions of uh, adaptation to um, different thermal climes that may be pressing mitochondrial genes to evolve in one direction or another. I don't have a good explanation for this because all of these different species occupy a variety of habitats. And this time frame right here, the Odontophora split uh, approximately 30 million years ago during the Oligocene. There were a lot of different things happening at the time. The Sea of Tethys was closing. The Antarctic Circumpolar Current was taking up. So a lot of changes in the marine environment, which may be able to explain some of these changes. But again, the fact that it's that large and only one marker gives me pause about hand-waving too much about it. However, another pattern that emerged um, was suggested by both ATB6 and cytochrome B. And this, this ratio here seemed a little bit more reasonable to me. So across the branch of purely Pseudocentrotus depressus and Mesocentrotus franciscanus, uh, formerly Strongylocentrotus franciscanus, suggests um, a much more rapid amino acid substitution. And in this case, uh, Mesocentrotus actually happens to occur in very northerly areas. It occurs uh, throughout the seas across Canada and in the North Atlantic. So it's possible that this, as well as cytonuclear incompatibility, might be potentially explained by thermal selection pressure. And finally, the third pattern, CO2, CO3, and ND1 all showed the exact same pattern here where Loxocinus albus and Pyrocentrotus levitus, representatives of the Echinidae family, showed very high DNDS ratios. Loxocinus albus actually occurs down so far south to as to occupy Antarctic waters. Interestingly enough, though, Stereocinus numeri is actually an Antarctic urchin exclusively, but did not show similarly variations in these markers. So, there is some evidence of rapid historical adaptation in some of these mitochondrial markers. Um, and so what are some reasons that might explain this rapidity by which mitochondrial markers can change? Again, I don't have very good explanations for what these changes mean physiologically, but the rate that they changed is surprising. And one potential explanation, if we think about the rate at which we expect new mutations to fix, generally we expect under a neutral system mutation rate to be the primary determinant of how often mutations are actually fixing. However, under strong selection, one of the things we have to consider is actually population size. We expect the rate of fixation to increase the larger the effective population size of the study organism is. And sea urchins have very large effective population sizes. I uh, estimated the effective population size of Central Pacific Chinese Gratilla, just as the back of the envelope calculation, and I know there are many different ways of doing that, but I got a rough estimate of over a million uh, individuals' effective population size in just the Central Pacific Ocean, which is very large for an effective population size. So, the mitochondrial genome is one thing, but for my full dissertation, the key point that I'm interested in is evolution across the genome. I'm in the process of sequencing my exome capture data to look at genes across the genome and try to identify areas of selection across their distribution. With that, I'd like to thank my committee, my funding sources, and various other folks, and I'd be happy to take any questions if I have time for one or two.